Hello there, and welcome to this video guide to chapter one of Susan Hill's novel, The Woman in Black. And chapter one is entitled Christmas Eve. And it's really significant that we look at chapter titles with Susan Hill's work, because as with many of the things that Susan Hill does, the names are important. And Christmas Eve seems like a fairly straightforward introduction to the novel and indeed it is surprise surprise the novel begins on christmas eve but it's a novel that is set well that starts a long time after the story has happened i'll discuss more of this in a little while if you've watched the introductory video you'll know something about the frame narrative and the novel begins with an author who is in his late 50s we're never really given precise dates and times or indeed physical locations this is a feature you'll find in quite a few victorian novels and particularly it's something that susan hill was quite keen to do she didn't want to make this is not a, it's not a, a novel which is historically accurate in terms of a portrayal of a specific time and place it's a novel that draws on general themes and aspects of its setting, which is Victorian, Edwardian, that ghost story, gothic genre. So Hill avoids being massively specific. And she's doing the same thing with the chronology of the characters. We meet in Arthur and we're not quite sure, he's quite vague about exactly how long since things have happened that he's talking about here and he's reflecting now on his past and he's reflecting on his present uh, as christmas is want to do it brings us this time of sort of thoughtful reflection on sort of where we are and he's talking in the first instance about how happy he is about how he's pleased the weather has changed and he goes through a reflection on how he first came to this house monk's peace this house that again if we look at the name here really does suggest that we've got a place that is a pleasant place it's a holy place that is it's a peaceful place uh, but whilst he's reflecting on this he tells the story of how he first came to see the the house for the very first time um whilst out in a pony and trap with mr bentley ponies and traps keep your eyes peeled or your ears peeled for those um and he just discussed the, the nervous illnesses that he suffered from and he talks about avoiding thinking of anything superstitious or supernatural ever since the terrible events and here we see hill using some of the techniques that will define this novel she drops hints she foreshadows things that are to come later in the narrative in this instance she's doing it in a very intriguing way playing with the chronology because she's foreshadowing things that have already happened but we're of course going to get the story of that so she's foreshadowing things that will happen later in the narrative although chronologically things that have already occurred and this is part of this tradition of, of ghost storytelling that it's often a story that has happened some time ago and is being retold to us through this frame narrative um, Arthur is inspired to tell his story through the telling of a ghost story. There's a ghost story telling competition happening in the house. Uh, this is a tradition, a British tradition, uh, a very kind of folksy way of passing the time on Christmas Eve of telling ghost stories in this campfire style way to try and see who can come up with the scariest possible story. And there's an interesting literary heritage going on behind this. Of course, we all know that there is one very famous ghost story that happens on Christmas Eve, a ghost story by a writer upon whom Hill draws heavily and is clearly influenced. Of course, Dickens' A Christmas Carol is a ghost story that's set on Christmas Eve. But this is also drawing on another tradition where there's actually an example of M.R. James doing this, where there's a group of people telling ghost stories, and this is a way into telling a series of ghost stories in compilation form. And M.R. James is clearly one of the influences uh, on Susan Hill's style. So Arthur goes 
into the house and of course here we have the retelling of the stories and they try to get him to join in and he has a panic attack inspired uh, by his real life ghost story which is as he puts it um you know both more ordinary and considerably more terrifying i paraphrase and arthur realizes that despite what he'd thought that he'd come out from under the shadow of this and it was never going to be something he'd ever have to face up to or think about again that it's come back and he decides the only way to to free himself from the shadow of his past in in the truest sense rather than to bury it and to ignore it is to purge it by telling the story uh he's not going to tell it out loud he's going to write it down it's a story that actually we we learn he's never told anybody in full so in this chapter we're actually introduced to a number of things so it's really worth noting these things down if you've got a copy of your own copy of the novel and you're studying this it's worth just um, noting these things as we're going through or finding somewhere to, to put this and keep this in a file somewhere so this is the chapter that introduces the idea that we are somewhere in the past it's not a specific or distinct location in fact actually it's it's confounding and this is compounded as we go through the, the rest of the novel what we are introduced to feels like a victorian christmas although there's no specific mention of this arthur is uh, at one point in time he goes around putting on the lamps but we're not sure whether he's lighting oil lamps, turning on gas lamps, or just flicking switches on electric lamps. Uh, if uh, um, if we were talking about a modern setting, you would just say he turned on the lights. You would use a very different verb, not putting on the lamps. That's a very different thing. Um, it, it's also a chapter where you see just a few hints that there's something really old fashioned going on here that he talks about oranges studded with cloves well you know i'm i'm fairly old and i've never seen that frankly in a house um this is the sort of thing that you might experience if you go to um uh an, an old you know something like a national trust property in the run-up to christmas and they'll have one of their um rooms set out like it was a victorian christmas and they would have the clove studded orange there this really doesn't feel like it's happening in you know the, the kind of post-war 1940s 50s 60s era it doesn't feel like that at all it feels much older very edwardian very victorian um open fires i mean open fires have been features of houses and again still are features of houses um for many many decades um and they were relatively common even uh, you know a, a, a few years ago uh, my grandparents all lived in houses with open fires and uh, you know you're talking about tracking back to the 1970s and 80s uh, but here we do get the feeling that this is a big roaring open log fire that this isn't a, a log burner they've had installed so again we get this sense of it happened in the past somewhere in the past but it again it's never clarified deliberately kept vague um we also start to hear the first hints of the backstory that we get some details that once we've read the whole story we're able to put them into their proper place we hear the fact that this is arthur's step family he married esme later on they were both slightly older we also hear that arthur has been a widower for some 12 years at the age of 35 so we are being signaled that there is something deep in his past that involves a tragic loss that has affected him. We also get the names of Eel Marsh House and Mrs. Drablow thrown out. No explanation offered, though. A typical Susan Hill fashion. She's throwing these things into the mix and leaving us to pick up on them or come back to them at a later point. And this chapter is also key because it sets out a number of specific techniques. So if we look at this, we see the pathetic fallacy. We even say Arthur himself says that his spirits have long been affected by the ways of the weather. I mean, that is a literal explanation of the pathetic fallacy. It's usually the, well, it can be the other way around where an author can use the weather to reflect a character's mood. Hill does this, but she also does it the other way around where she uses the weather to manipulate the character's mood or more broadly to set the feeling and tone of a scene. 
We also get the use of foreshadowing, foreshadowing, which is something that happens right the way throughout this novel. And we are introduced to the frame narrative, this very, very typically gothic style, this Victorian style, and this very, very typical technique that you see within particularly the 19th century, early 20th century ghost story. So let's have a look at the setting and the frame narrative. So again, these are the images that we hear described, and they are particularly representative of Victorian uh, and Edwardian era Christmases. Um, but again, the, the, the numbers don't necessarily add up. But as I said, this, this frame narrative is just a brilliant use of an intertextual reference, this idea that Hill is saying, look, I'm drawing on these previous traditions. You have some expectations and I may fulfill them. I may not, but I'm going to use your understanding and I'm going to play with it. And this is something that Hill definitely does. So um, there's an, an, an interesting link here, which tells us about a very famous ghost story competition, which is the one that gives rise to the writing of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Again, a really very, if not the most famous example of the, the Gothic tradition. Uh, in literature. So if you want some further information, there is a link there that you can go and follow and have a look at. So let's have a look at some key quotations. So number one, my spirits have for many years been excessively affected by the ways of the weather. Now, when you come to the exam, you're not necessarily expected to memorize great screeds of text, and particularly those students who are following the edXL English GCSE syllabus. For their literature, uh, the modern novel and play is a closed book exam with only a very short quotation to base your response from. And it isn't a memory test. So paraphrased quotations or knowing where, what happens specifically in which chapter and in which order the events go is fine. That's called a direct textual, textual reference if you're able to do that. But having a handful of quotations in the back pocket is never going to be a bad thing. So we will go through in these videos um, some key quotations that might be worth working through and developing and remembering. So this one here is a really interesting one because this does really figure a lot later on in the novel. And the author is clearly signaling that the pathetic fallacy is key and important. And once you've been through the novel, you later work out why Arthur has been affected by the ways of the weather. And again, here we've got the foreshadowing, foreshadowing done in this strange retrospective way because of course the chronology is this is a flashback this is a frame narrative i'm going to tell you what has happened to me i'm going to explain how i came to have occasional nervous illnesses and conditions of the, of as a result of the experiences i will come to relate arthur has essentially what i think you might well describe as ptsd from the nightmarish scenario that he finds himself enmeshed in and of course, this is here, we are being told, I'm going to tell you this story. Uh, I'm going to unfold this. And as a result, we have a background level of tension because we know something dreadful will happen. There are loads of examples of foreshadowing scattered throughout um, chapter one. I'm not going to go through them here, but can you spot them? Can you find them, highlight them, identify them? Again, another little significant detail thrown in here, a subtle detail thrown into the frame narrative. And it is the subtlety and the amount of detail that gets thrown in, in a very unforegrounded way that Susan Hill doesn't draw masses of attention to them. Some of them, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that occur in later chapters, should be, if you were to film them, would be blindingly obvious. But because they're in the novel form and we move from one piece of information to the next to the next to the next very very quickly we don't always spot these happening and this is really interesting the idea that we have arthur talking about you know, nothing so nothing so blood curdling and becreeped and crude not so so laughable the truth is quite other and altogether more terrible and this is of course this is fiction but here we have the character making the story seem even more sinister by focusing on the idea that this is in fact a real ghost story that Arthur has to tell. So there you have it, chapter one of The Woman in Black. Uh, the key aim here is to set up the things that are going to happen. And what is really interesting is, is that so much of the detail in this chapter 
almost never comes back to. We're given a list of characters in Arthur's life who literally mean nothing in terms of the main plot narrative. This step family that he has don't feature. And, uh, and I'm not giving away too many spoilers here. The reason I think that they exist and the reason I think this entire chapter exists is to give Arthur this sense of a life that has been lived, a man who was at peace until this was disturbed, which gives the final chapter even more of an emotional punch. Because here we have a real person who's lived a life and here are the details of his life. And they are there really so that we can generate a bit more empathy with Arthur Kipps. So frame narrative, establishing Arthur as a character, throwing in some foreshadowing and bringing out the pathetic fallacy as a key technique. Chapter one. Thank you very much for listening.